What up, everybody? This is your boy, God with Tinder, aka We Boss the Truth. Or uh, whatever names that you want to call me, baby. It's only one me in the world, but this is the part two of my boom boom that I started up today with my last video. So you guys about to see why I believe in Jesus so much and about my life getting changed from the direction of all the things that I'm about to do. So I'm about to show you this guy's video. It's a little long. So please watch it if you want to. Then you can learn more things about it. Alright, here it goes. PlayStation. PlayStation. YouTube. Start. This is what you want to put in. God versus saving. And they got some options right here. And then you click on this one right here. This is the one that's a little long. Uh, so this is the one that you want to click on. The one that says 117. Enjoy. An epic conflict between good and evil. There's a deep struggle going on. Has given rise to our understanding of God and Satan. Oh, so perfect to this system. We have to have a villain to get the hero. The struggle is described in ancient texts. But how have these writings helped us to comprehend the contest between heaven and hell? And there's a contest between Satan and God for the souls of men. Their daily combat. Is the story that animates people's lives for centuries. Will this conflict culminate in Armageddon? There will be a major battle. Nobody exactly knows where that is. The Bible says God's going to be set up with it. God is going to deal with Satan forever. Will the signs of the battle? The evidence. Believers are in a state of. And I know this is long, but you guys need that Jesus in your life. You really do. That's why I put this video on. Hello. You're getting awfully close to this becoming a reality. Uh, the fulfillment looks like it's right on the horizon. The idea of an enduring contest between good and evil has long fascinated human imagination and intrigued scholars of all faiths. Believers in this cosmic contest think mankind cannot escape this ultimate confrontation, a day of cataclysmic destruction. Bring about the end of the universe and everything in existence in an instant. 
for millennia, predicting how the end will come, has occupied certain sections of three of the world's major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These people think evidence of these end days is abundant. They maintain that everyday occurrences like flood, famine, and pestilence are clear signs the titanic struggle between darkness and light is already upon us. The idea underlying the apocalypse in the Hebrew Bible and in the Christian scripture it is that there is a war between good and evil, between God and the devil. Some believe the catastrophic ending of the war between God and Satan looms just over the horizon, and it will result in the annihilation of the planet very soon indeed. And there's a titanic contest between Satan and God for the souls of men. At the core of the apocalyptic tradition is Satan's campaign to manipulate the human soul and to test believers' loyalty to God. Their committed allegiance he is determined to destroy. In the apocalyptic worldview, this struggle will culminate at some final point at the end of history in a crescendo of conflict. The enduring idea of an apocalyptic end of time emerges from the historic texts in some vivid descriptions and also oblique hints gradually revealed and interpreted over time. Many people think apocalypse means just catastrophe or disaster, but it's actually a Greek word meaning uh, an unveiling of, of hidden truth or hidden knowledge. And it was actually a literary form that emerged in the ancient Middle East. This is really the, the meaning of the word apocalypse. The secrets are revealed. And that's e exactly the meaning of the word apocalypse. It means the revealing of something uh, kept secret. The idea of an apocalypse has evolved through the course of history, inspiring the determined quest for an answer to the age-old question of who will emerge the winner. And what this will mean for our world. Believers and scholars have researched a variety of sources to uncover the evidence. The first outlines of the prophesied clash between good and evil begin to appear about the first century BC in the book called The Apocalypse of Ezra. There's a revolutionary new idea in human religion that emerges and is carried forward into Christian scripture and Islamic scripture, and it is the idea that God works his will in history, and that history has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that the end is something catastrophic. The three great religions of the book have all contributed to the roots of this end of days theological argument. Christianity emerged uh, really out of Judaism and uh, the Islamic faith drew upon both Judaism and, and Christianity. And a part of that common ground of all three religions is an apocalyptic vision of, of the future. Now, when we go back to the original text, we find these uh, similarities uh, so vivid, the end of the day and the uh, end of the world, uh, that there are so many commonalities between these three uh, religions. The documents of these religions depict the foundations of the battle between God and Satan. But to fully understand the struggle, we must first examine the combatants. The first would come to be known as the creator of the universe, God.
Ancient civilizations, like those of the Egyptians and the Sumerians, worshipped a pantheon of many gods, some compassionate, some wrathful. Each governed a different aspect of daily life. You would appeal to one god uh, if there was a drought. You would appeal to another god if you were besieged by your enemies. Then, in the Torah, or five books of Moses, the Jews began to describe a singular omnipotent deity. The great achievement of the ancient Jews, of course, was to arrive at the concept of, of a single god, a single supreme being. By the 7th century BC, the belief in multiple deities disappeared from Judaic law, and the concept of monotheism became prevalent. The idea of one God is what makes Israel and the people of Israel very, very unique. This was virtually unheard of. The Jews believed their all-powerful deity was not only a god of love, but also of vengeance. This God is primarily bounteous, merciful, generous, life-giving. But this God will not let the guilty get away free. In the book of Genesis, God rewarded the righteous and punished the wicked. He ordered a great flood. Rained down fire and brimstone on the corrupted cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and condemned the Jews to wander aimlessly across the desert for 40 years, all because of their disobedience. This was a God who had chosen his people and punished his people if they were uh, sinful and, uh, and did not worship him uh, properly. Faith in one sole deity remained strong among the Jews of the ancient world. But the belief that he was the creator of all evil on earth did not last. The idea of one God is responsible for rewards and blessings. Sorrows and joys becomes very difficult. Perhaps God is not the singular God who causes all of the evil in the world. Perhaps there is another force at work. It didn't take long for people to grow uncomfortable with the existential dilemma of expressing thanksgiving to the same deity whom they held responsible for all the trouble in life. Slowly, out of the writings, a dark and shadowy figure began to take shape. And so the idea began to emerge that, in fact, it's not God who is the author of the, the problems that face good people. It's the devil. It's Satan. Satan, you might say, is a coping mechanism for monotheists. Early in the Hebrew Bible, Satan was described as being in the service of God, but over time, he grew rebellious and subversive, unto the point where he declared himself unwilling to obey his maker. Ha-Satan is the Hebrew word ha the satan adversary, the adversary. Satan is one of these low-level heavenly functionaries whose job it is to move between heaven and earth and report back to God. Satan's steady rise to corruptive power culminated in the New Testament, in which he is portrayed as the ultimate creator of all the planet's tragedies and terrors. And one who is a personification of evil, who is the one that is behind the scenes battling God and the things of God and the people of God. The development of the idea of an evil Satan 
allowed the Jews to worship a God of pure goodness. And Satan is the adversary working against the good who stops the perfect world from, uh, from occurring, the great adversary of the great good of God. <laughs> The stage was set for a skirmishes that would lead to a final confrontation, the ultimate battle to win the souls of men and to determine the fate of the world. I would say perfect to a success from you have to have a villain if you have a hero. The sacred texts and traditions of Jews, Christians, and Muslims not only refer to the origins of the war between God and Satan, they also describe one of the most venerated and coveted of earthly spoils, the city of Jerusalem. There was a whole mythology surrounding Jerusalem that it was the special dwelling place of God. And so it became the physical symbol of the presence of God. Jerusalem had been the spiritual homeland of the Jews since the 10th century BC and the site of their holiest temple. For Christians, it was where Jesus was crucified around 34 AD and where he is to reign when he returns to earth. That's my stuff, y'all. Muslims believe it was from Jerusalem that Muhammad visited heaven and it is now the site of the Dome of the Rock and the great Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, Jerusalem that figures in most of the different uh, scenarios of Jews, Christians, and Muslims on the end of days story is seen as the center of the universe, the navel of the universe, because this is the place where it all began. And this is basically the place where it's going to end. This sacred city is also the place the faithful believe Satan most wants for himself. For them, Jerusalem is the arena for the fight to the death between God and Satan. The first key to understanding the evolution of the story is a collection of recovered writings found in a cave in Qumran. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written by a devout clan of scribes. They tell of, among many other things, Satan's growing power and of an approaching catastrophe. Intimations of the early concepts of the battle between God and Satan are contained in some of the oldest religious writings thus far discovered. The Dead Sea Scrolls, written between 200 BC and 100 AD, were found in remote desert caves close to the village of Qumran near Jericho. They are thought to have been hidden about the time of the fall of Jerusalem in 66 AD and they codify the beliefs of a mystical sect of devout Jews called the Essenes. The Essenes are the major apocalyptic group of Jews who emerge out of Jerusalem in the 2nd century BC. The Essenes' writings laid out some of the events that they believed would lead to the final contest. They also convey some of the concepts underlying the theology of the Apocalypse. One of the threads that runs continuously through the religions is precisely this expectation of the Day of Judgment. And each of these three religions, in its own way, has interpreted and understood the same idea. The Essenes broke away from their temple in Jerusalem because they felt it had become too tolerant of other religions. They fled to build a more devout community hidden deep in the desert. A 
As dedicated scholars, they amassed a vast collection of religious writings. Numbering almost 1,000 documents, these became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Concealed deep in a dark room, they were rediscovered 2,000 years later by a Palestinian shepherd. The Essenes believed that the battle would take place near Jerusalem and that the future of the world as they knew it would be at stake. And their leader was going to lead them in this end of day scenario where the sons of light would defeat the sons of darkness. The scrolls are among the most important religious texts ever found. They established the Essenes as one of the earliest groups to write about the conflict between God and Satan. The idea of an army of believers led by God and an evil empire under the command of the wicked prince of darkness, Satan, emerges clearly from the scrolls. It's during this period that a kind of thinking begins to emerge that we refer to as apocalypse. The Hebrew Book of Wisdom, written in the 1st or 2nd century BC, shows Satan escaping the authority of God and becoming an autonomous lord of darkness. Satan is featured as this demonic thug with a bunch of demonic cohorts who fall to earth and wreak havoc on the earth. There are several documents that refer to Satan's break with God. The devil, resentful of his role as servant to the Almighty, leads a failed rebellion against God, which ends in his banishment from heaven. The episode earns Satan one of his many names. The book of Isaiah refers to him as a fallen star, Lucifer. He rebels against God. He rebels against the, the whole order of righteousness in heaven. And a third of the angels join him. They're expelled from heaven. They fall. It's a very dramatic story of angels who actually rebel and become uh, loyal not to God but to Satan, their leader. Islam calls the dark force by a different name, but echoes the biblical narrative of a rebellious serpent. Muslims believe that uh, Satan were originally created out of fire, uh, while angels were created originally out of light. The Satan had the privilege of hanging on the angels when he disobeyed God. Uh, God ousted him. The three religions also share the belief that Satan's arrogance brought him into conflict with God and caused his banishment. Lucifer's preying on humans has been universally understood as his revenge on mankind. Satan becomes a force not co-equal with God, but becomes a force which is autonomous, totally removed from God's ability to control. In the story of the fall, pride and envy are believed to have motivated Satan, firing his determination to destroy God's loving relationship with mankind. It became his burning, ravenous desire to win over the souls of men and make them pay him homage. In Christianity, Satan is viewed as a fallen angel and uh, is carrying on warfare against God and against the forces of righteousness. And, and this explains the existence of evil. 
Throughout history, Satan has been seen as a creature who probes God, searching for weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Each encounter emboldens him further. Each test escalates the momentum and magnitude of the climactic battle ahead. Apocalyptic thinking is about how there is a universal, invisible network led by an arch-criminal mastermind. Satan was understood to increase his power through weaponry and trickery, to shift shape, and to possess or inhabit other beings to do his wicked work for him. Satan can assume various forms, and throughout history, this is one of his signature calling cards, that he can lurk about unseen. This is a, a particular talent that Satan happens to have, and he's never really alone. He has a group of other figures, demonic figures, who work with him. The devil's most familiar physical form is held to be that of the serpent. His first infamous act against humanity was to invade, unseen, God's sacred Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were living in loving harmony with their Creator. Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, chronicles this early encounter between... So you guys see how I told you about Adam and Eve? It results in the origin of the... Who would be born in heaven original and not down here on earth? Throughout history, man has looked to the heavens for answers to life's confounding questions. The quest for answers has led to the awareness not only of God, but also of another powerful being, one of unadulterated evil. The texts of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims all refer to him as Satan. Satan is the center of the evil influence behind the scenes of what is going on in the world. In various religious texts, Satan is seen continually in competition with God for the souls of men. Each encounter rendering him more determined and more prepared for the ultimate conflict, the dreaded end of days. Satan is presented as a figure who wants to test human beings, who hopes that he can draw human beings away from the worship of God to his side in this conflict. Mankind's struggle against evil is present from the start of the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, a serpent enters the Garden of Eden. Satan was born in the garden of Eden. And the snake is that manifestation. The snake became the symbol for evil as it later developed within Jewish tradition. This version of Satan as the wicked tempter of man is reinforced in the Islamic interpretation. The Satan has the power of tempting the human beings. The Satan has no more power to force any human being to commit a sin. It is the human being who will commit the sin. Satan's ability to seduce is described as one of his most effective weapons in the battle to win the souls of men. For many believers, the serpent that persuaded Eve to eat fruit from the tree of knowledge is proof of the devil at work. In the story, Eve convinced Adam that he should also eat the forbidden fruit, an act God could not forgive. It has been interpreted by Jews, Christians, and Muslims as man's original sin and one of Satan's greatest victories. The 
he permits Satan a certain degree of latitude in the Garden of Eden. He permitted Satan to tempt innocent Adam and Eve, and they fell into sin voluntarily. The Almighty cast out from the garden his beloved Adam and Eve, but reserved his severest wrath for Satan. According to the ancient writings, he condemned his fallen angel to live forever in the form he adopted to lure Adam and Eve into treachery. The opening skirmish in the war ended with the realization that the souls of men would henceforth be always vulnerable to satanic trickery. The Bible says that he's the master liar, he's the master deceiver, so we don't really know what form he may take from the standpoint of appearance, but we do recognize the effects of his presence. Because of his cunning use of shape-shifting and disguise, descriptions of Satan's physical form would be derived from a composite of ancient representations of evil. The pitchfork, for example, is Poseidon's trident. The red color comes from the Egyptian evil deity Set. The horns come from the Greek Pan, or the Canaanite deity named Abayu, who has horns and a tail. All of those are different elements that lead into satanic lore from other cultures, actually. Satan's perceived ability to possess and control man would lead people to see his agents at work in the behavior of others, particularly their enemies. There are some acts of humanity that are so beyond any human explanation that uh, we sit back and say, it would appear that Satan is really the perpetrator of this behind the scenes. Satan's supposed triumph in the Garden of Eden indicated that it was only a matter of time before he would try again to challenge God's relationship with man. The Old Testament book of Job describes just such a challenge. This time, Satan was bold enough to abandon all disguise. Satan's most glorious appearance begins in the book of Job. This is the most detailed exposition of the character of Satan. Satan tried again to antagonize God by targeting his most prized creation, man. But on this occasion, Satan relied not on slimy seduction, but on brute force. The Old Testament text indicates that Satan had not yet developed into the potent and complete embodiment of evil, but was still in God's employment as a kind of celestial prosecutor. And Satan is very much in the Lord's service. He's watching people who might be suspicious. This is the angel whose job it is to conduct moral audits of human virtue. Satan is said to be on a constant watch for weaknesses, looking for the people who could be tempted away from God's service. He focused his ill intent on one of the men of whom God was most proud, Job. He's a very pious person. He has great kids, he has a great family, he seems to have everything that one could want. And then Satan appears. So Satan challenged God by asking permission to test the faith of Job. Hasatan basically says, is it for nothing that Job is so religious? We have given him everything. What's not to love about you, God? And 
then they have this little wager. Hasatan basically says, let me hurt him a little bit. Let me ruin his life, and we'll see if he still holds fast to his faith. And God, of course, accepts the challenge. God told Satan he could do anything he wanted to Job's possessions, which included seven sons, three daughters, a number of servants, and more than 10,000 animals. But he must not lay a finger on Job himself. The Bible says Satan commanded a full arsenal in the testing of Job. He would not shy away from torture in order to break the spirit of God's devoted subject. Do you find him arguing with God? If you uh, take everything away from him, he'll turn against you. If you strike his body, he'll turn against you. So God allows for Job's farm, Job's livestock, Job's hired hands, and Job's children all to be destroyed. To Satan's amazement, the agonizing losses had hardly any effect on Job's commitment to his faith. And so Job passes the first test. But then God and Satan say, well, let's push him just a little more to see if it's really true he can't be moved. Job finally began to waver, and then he questioned aloud why God would allow him to suffer so grievously. Finally, he gets fed up. He turns around to God. He says, why are these things happening to me? And well, God turns to Job and says, you are a human being with limited understanding. You're all good and evil. The entire world, you'll never understand. All you can do is live a pious life. Come to your religious institution and pray. Do right. The book of Job maps out what can we do. Job realized his error in an instant, begged forgiveness, and survived the grueling test of faith. He received God's reward. Satan's attempt to break the bond of God with his most devoted follower failed. But the devil's audacious cruelty, as demonstrated in this encounter, marks a clear evolution in his progress. The struggle begins in the Garden of Eden. And Satan successfully tempts Eve. It's certainly present in the book of Job, in which Satan, by bringing these disasters into Job's life, tries to persuade him to renounce God. In the period between the Old and New Testaments, from about 200 BC to 70 AD, a variety of ancient texts portray Satan as an increasingly provocative manipulator of human affairs. If you think of Satan's birth in the Old Testament, during the period between the Testaments, this is where he hits his adolescence, if you will. And then when we hit the New Testament, this is where he is in the, the Titan of Evil. He is a full, fully formed adult. And this is the apocalyptic story, and its central narrative is the conspiracy theory of Satan and his demons out there messing with humanity behind every bush and around every corner. The concept of a struggle between good and evil gradually became a central motif in many of the religious texts, and ultimately the messages began to suggest that the forces of good would be successful in the end. The, um, the ultimate message is that in the end, righteousness will win out. God will triumph over evil. Remember that apocalyptic literature is addressed to an audience who is undergoing some type of persecution or they're suffering. It is the literature of crisis. The apocalyptic texts of the Jews had also prophesied the arrival of a savior, a figure sent by God to guide the faithful and combat the forces of evil. The word Messiah, Hebrew Mashiach, means anointed. The Greek equivalent is Christos, known to us as 
Christ. It was a term used especially for a king, but it also gets to happen that a foregal uh, way of designating somebody as the Lord's elected one. And that's where we get the idea of a messianic savior who will one day come at the behest of heaven to save the suffering humanity on earth. The writings of Jews, Christians, and Muslims all share the idea of a divine emissary who will lead the charge in the battle against evil. Christian scripture indicates that Satan will up the ante, taking on God in the form of his earthly incarnation, Jesus Christ. To some, this sets Satan and God on the journey of no return, an unstoppable course leading to the final confrontation. And this story then, the earthly embodiment of goodness, the earthly embodiment of evil, this story of their daily combat for the souls of humans is going to be the story that animates people's lives for centuries. Throughout history, Satan has been portrayed as the arch seducer of mankind, using skilled deceit as a means to taunt God and draw him towards a final conflagration. One example has been seen as the most brazen. In this encounter, Satan targeted the human embodiment of God. His son, Jesus Christ. The early apocalyptic writings spoke of a Messiah, a savior chosen by God who would enter the holy city of Jerusalem and prepare the faithful for the confrontation with Satan. Those first Christians were essentially Jews uh, who had embraced the very simple idea that distinguishes Judaism from Christianity, the idea that the long-promised Messiah is Jesus of Nazareth. Some commentators viewed Christ as that Savior. It is in the New Testament that the concept of Christ being both human and divine is developed. For the Christians, Jesus represented a very human face for God. And that combination of power and vulnerability was so intriguing and so unique. Jesus is this vivid, earthly representation of God. In opposing Christ, Satan was able to confront God face to face. At this point, he had morphed into a powerful, independent villain and had gathered an army of demonic servants to do his bidding. It is only in the that the world has matured, has changed, and transformed into God's enemy. The encounter between Christ and Satan is documented in the Gospels, the accounts of Christ's life written by his closest adherents. The temptation story in the Gospels is Jesus' ordeal to see if he's really got the right stuff to be the Son of God, to be the Messiah. Jesus went into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. Satan followed him into the desert. The first temptation, he goes out to be tested and he encounters Satan in the wilderness. The wilderness is a testing place in the Bible. Fasting had left Jesus physically weak and debilitated. And Satan saw this as his opportunity. He issued his first challenge. 
and commanded the Son of God to turn stones into bread. Turn these stones into bread. Now that's an interesting temptation right in itself. You're up against deity here, and uh, he won't do it to satisfy himself after 40 days of fasting. Jesus deflected Satan's provocation by quoting scripture at him. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone. Satan then asked Jesus if he would fling himself off the temple. He quotes Deuteronomy saying that angels will support you, and Jesus uh, quotes again Deuteronomy and says, you know, you shouldn't put the word of God to the test. As Satan continued to probe the possibility of Jesus' human frailty, he summoned the greatest temptation of all to capture the soul of the Son of God. Finally, in the third temptation, Satan stops that, and he finally shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world, and he says, all right, all right, just pay me a little homage. Just bow down a little bit, give me a little worship here, and you can have it all. Would Jesus sell his soul to the devil in exchange for all the power, all the glory of this world? Jesus successfully resisted Satan's temptations, proving to many present at the time that he was the long-awaited Messiah. By directly taking on Christ and therefore God, Satan had intensified their trial of strength. The stakes had been raised higher than ever before. In his sermons, Christ began to warn of the violent apocalyptic crash that was to come. He based some of his preaching on an imminent end of the world. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he's talking to them, he says, This people standing here this day that will not taste death before the coming of the kingdom. He believed that that end time was going to be either in his lifetime or in the lifetime of his followers. Jesus himself spelled out many of the signs by which his followers could recognize the coming of the final days. One of the things that he was preaching was that the kingdom of God is at hand. An apocalyptic connotation that it is promising a drastic change in the whole order of things. Some Christians believe he was referring to the end of days and the final defeat of Satan. In a sermon called the Olivet Discourse, he prophesied a time of terrible tribulation for his people. Jerusalem, God's holy city, would be surrounded by foreign armies, its inhabitants taken prisoner and killed, and the temple destroyed. Not a single stone would be left standing. Christ told his followers they would be persecuted and false prophets would emerge. There would be wars, famine, and earthquakes. But even that degree of punishment would not compare with the terrors to come. To his followers, it might have seemed that signs of Satan abounded in first century Jerusalem under Roman occupation. The curse of evil was seen to be obvious in the ruthlessness of the emperor and the debauchery of the Roman ruling classes. Pagan Roman society, the good life yeah, that was available to a citizen of Rome, it was a place of tremendous cultural richness, art, theater, statuary, uh, drama, the, the games of the circus. All of these things were looked on as corruptions. The Romans perceived Christ's prophecies of change and a new kingdom as a threat to their authority. They concluded that Jesus had to be stopped. 
the Romans thought of Jesus as a traitor to Rome and one who was a dangerous man, and that's why he was crucified. According to the New Testament, in order to identify the man who was to be crucified, the Roman centurions bribed Judas, one of Jesus' closest friends, to betray him. But the text suggests that Judas might not have been entirely to blame for his treachery. There is a reference to Satan entering into Judas, which would suggest that Judas's betrayal of Jesus, which led to his arrest and torture and crucifixion, was a satanic plot. The crucifixion of Jesus seemed to the disciples to mark the zenith in the conflict between God and Satan. Christ himself predicted the end would be marked by a period of chaos and suffering. Had it already arrived? Jesus came to earth to be the king of Israel. He didn't. He failed. He was crucified. He was totally defeated. How do you explain that? Christians believe Jesus Christ was the long-awaited Messiah, God's own son, and his earthly emissary, heralding the coming kingdom of heaven. The New Testament shows Satan setting his malign sights on Jesus. But despite his most persuasive temptations, Lucifer was no match for the power of the divine. Many of the followers of Jesus at the time thought that since Satan couldn't attain Christ's subservience, he had sought to bring about his death. The power of evil was aware of who Jesus was and who he was meant to be in God's scheme of things and, and was aiming for him. And the Gospel of Luke and, and John say, well, Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, and it was Satan who instigated the death of Jesus. If Satan's infiltration of Judas had resulted in the crucifixion, that would have dealt God a fateful blow. But the devil's victory was short-lived. Three days after Christ's death, his followers reported entering an empty tomb. Jesus was thought to be raising the dead and taken up to heaven. The early Christians came to worship Jesus as a prophet of peace and not of retribution. Jewish tradition entertains the idea of a Messiah. The Messiah is seen as a earthly king, an earthly sovereign who will sit on an earthly throne and usher in a period of peace and harmony. Now, the enigma of Jesus is that he never looked much like that. His followers say he must have been a different kind of messiah. Christ's friends were awed and thrilled by the resurrection and set out to spread the story as fast as possible. Their excitement soon gave way to fear. They suffered increasing persecution. Christ's triumph over Satan didn't turn out to be the immediate earthly vindication they had hoped for. Those followers documented his own idea of the future, very violent events that would occur to herald Christ's return and the final clash with Satan. These biblical writings describing the coming end of days are known to us as the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation is one of the strangest books in the Bible. It doesn't have any ethics, it doesn't have any wisdom sayings, it doesn't have any poetry, it really consists of dreams and nightmares, of visions. The recipient of these visions was John of Patmos. This pious but embittered author 
is thought to have written his end of days nightmare scenario sometime about 70 AD. At the time, John was in exile, a refugee from the devastated city of Jerusalem, destroyed by the Romans. Well, the Roman Empire was a, was a the political power of the day, and it was in many ways hostile to Christians because Christians were viewed as a, as a threat uh, if they refused to engage in emperor worship. John's desire for vengeance against the Roman oppressors permeates the book of Revelation. It is a book of deep longing for revenge against one's imagined enemies, of angry denunciation of one's rivals. The Apocalypse of John, as the book is also known, unveils for the first time the prophecy of a final battle between God and Satan. It asserts that God will address the wrongs committed by his former servant. God is going to come back and avenge his people, his nation, his holy place. And he will do that when Jesus, his Messiah, returns with all the armies of heaven. The writings of John of Patmos coalesce the signs found in Judaic Old Testament texts with Christ's New Testament end of days prophecies. They were intended to warn of the wrath that would engulf the earth and help mankind prepare to survive Satan's ultimate offensive. But the book of Revelation is one of the most vivid in its imagery uh, in representing this, this cosmic conflict uh, between good and evil. The book begins with God seated on his throne in heaven. Next to the throne is a scroll, secured by seven seals. Seven is a holy number in Hebrew tradition. To unlock the scrolls, an angel must find someone worthy of the task. There's another image of Jesus, apparently, and that is the slaughtered lamb with eyes all over it. It's a very weird and kind of grotesque image. But it says, because the lamb has been slain, the lamb is worthy to receive the book and open the seals and speak the prophecies about what will happen. The prophecy unfolds with similarly bizarre images, disturbing omens of the coming catastrophe. The breaking of the seven seals is the occasion for a series of what we would understand to be natural disasters or cataclysms that will be brought to earth by God at the end of days. A new and even more violent event unfolds as each seal is broken. You see a whole series of heavenly visions, beginning with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All of them come emerging with agonies that are going to come onto the earth. A red horse brings war. A black horse brings famine. And a green horse brings death. The white horse foretells an evil leader coming in the future, an accomplice of Satan. The rider on the white horse plunges the world in war, the conqueror that is coming in the future. The breaking of the fifth seal sees Christian martyrs gathering at the throne of God, asking him to avenge the wrongs wrought by Satan throughout human history. And they're the people who've been killed, slaughtered, because of their faith in Jesus. And they say, 
Lord, how long? How long is it going to be before you avenge our blood on earth? The breaking of the sixth and seventh seals sets off terrible cataclysms. Hail rains down from the heavens, striking a third of the earth. Burning mountains are thrown into the sea, which turns blood red. A star falls and turns a third of all fresh water bitter. A third of the sun, stars, and moon turn black. The waters of the earth uh, turn to blood, uh, as of the blood of dead men. Insects emerge from the earth. The, the cosmos itself uh, is in chaos. God, in his wrath, has only just begun the grisly task. Next, he sends seven angels, and as each sounds his trumpet, new torments are unleashed. These angels are followed by another seven, carrying bowls. Each bowl contains a new cauldron of horrors for humankind. The seventh bowl causes a final earthquake, the largest ever experienced on Earth. The world will be in chaos, and the faithful will recognize these signs as the approach of the end of days. One of the themes of the book of Revelation is that the end will be a signal by events in the here and now, events in the natural world, that are meant to warn the men and women on earth of these impending disasters. The apocalyptic visions of the Jewish texts, coupled with the dark omens of Revelation, gave intimation to Jews of the coming crisis. They also became a basis for the Islamic vision of the end days. We Muslims believe that there will be many battles and many disasters. Uh, probably disasters uh, as the scale of world uh, wars. There will be struggle as it had been for thousands of years. Struggle between evil powers and good powers. In early Islam, the, the earliest writings, the earliest years of Islam, there was a, in fact a strong apocalyptic strain that one finds in the Quran that echoes passages from the book of Revelation. Revelation's horrific events do not only describe natural disasters. Its most terrifying chapter reveals Satan's plan in preparation for Armageddon. He will introduce his own earthly emissaries, just as God had brought forth Jesus. Revelation depicts a snake-like dragon standing on the seashore. Satan in Revelation is a red serpent uh, with seven heads and ten horns. And lest we mistake who this serpent is, this is the old serpent that tempted Eve, the same uh, devil that appears in the Hebrew Bible, is carried forward into the book of Revelation. The devil summons two beasts, one from the sea and one from the earth. These are the accomplices of Satan who will do his evil work on the planet in the final days. The beast from the earth is the false prophet, and the beast from the sea is the Antichrist. The lawless one that shall come in the future. Uh, John, in his letters, calls him Antichristos, anti-against Christ. And the beast out of the earth is the false religious leader. And you have a kind of, almost a trinity of evil. The book of Revelation predicts a terrifying prelude to the final battle between God and Satan. This section of the New Testament describes a seven-year period of strife for humanity and sets out the omens that will signal its arrival. God's messengers will deliver his wrath upon the earth, 
and diabolical beasts will emerge from the chaos. Controlled by Satan himself, these beasts will take human form and bring about Armageddon. Will God allow mankind to suffer such agonies? A group of radical Christians believes that some people will be spared. There's a great deal of suffering in this book, but Christians today debate whether God's people will have to endure it or not. Some Christians claim that those who belong to God will be taken out of the world before the seven years of the most intense suffering. There is a group of Christians that believe God's people will be raptured, that is, whisked away to reside with him, leaving behind them the global mayhem and suffering. The idea of the rapture has been derived from various translations of the New Testament through the ages. The word itself emanates from a single verse of St. Paul's letters in the book of Thessalonians. The Greek text uses the term harpazo, which means snatched away, caught away, zap, you're out of here. When the Bible is translated from Greek into Latin, the word became rapti, and in English it became rapture. It's an idea that has appealed to some sections of the Christian imagination. All believers are going to be taken up. Billions of people will be snatched up and meet the Lord in the air. In this scenario, cars will crash, planes will hurtle to the earth, but none of God's elect will be left to suffer Satan's domination. This idea solves the problem of revelation for the true believer who feels that they do not merit the terrible suffering that the the book of Revelation seems to promise. They cling to the idea that they will magically disappear off the face of the earth before the real suffering begins. The prophecy forewarns humans that Satan will use his emissaries to recruit gullible warriors for the coming conflict. As it's described in the book of Revelation, this is a time of intense worldwide conflict and chaos uh, that the world has never seen. The need for somebody to step in and bring order out of chaos, a world leader figure, the book of Revelation calls him the beast. Uh, John in his letters called him the Antichrist. The beasts that emerge in Revelation are Satan's henchmen. The beast from the sea is the vision of an antichrist, a man who will come in the form of a political leader. At the outset, the antichrist will appear a benign figure in order to gain power. And then all of a sudden, a person steps on the scene and says, you know what, we, we've got to come together. We there has to be world peace. I've got a plan. Follow me. How's he going? And the Bible says the whole world follows after him. Okay. This embodiment Just of the checking in on you. Right? The Antichrist will be assisted by another beast. The beast from the earth will be a religious leader who will aid the Antichrist in luring souls to the dark side. The beast out of the earth, who is later clearly called the false prophet, who causes the world to worship the beast. The Antichrist will become ever more hungry for power and ever more evil, establishing a single world government and one sole world religion. So in the book of Revelation, Satan is the center of the evil influence behind the scenes of what is going on in the world and is being played out through the activity of the beast of the false prophet. Satan's followers, according to the Bible, will be branded with the mark of the beast. 666 will identify those who will be commanded by Satan's lieutenant, the Antichrist. Those that believe in him, that choose him instead of Jesus Christ, will receive the mark on the back of their hand or on their forehead. They'll have this mark that distinguishes them as a believer of Antichrist, but really they're believing in Satan. 
and they worship Satan, and those who reject will often be killed. Historically, 666 has been understood as an early Christian cipher, symbolic of the oppression of the Romans and their emperors. The alphabets of the ancient world were used as numbers as well as letters, and so you could uh, create an alphanumeric code. If you then translated those numbers back into letters, you got the name of a Roman emperor. But most commonly, it's read, of course, is the name of the Emperor Nero, who was said to be the first to persecute the Christians. Satan is said by these believers to draw the battle with God closer by inhabiting the Antichrist and demanding the loyalty of man. He will be indwelt by Satan himself, and he will be the embodiment of evil, and he'll have people worship him. Every human being during that tribulation period will have an opportunity to make their choice, Satan or God. So as Satan gathers his recruits, the cataclysmic events described in Revelation continue to unfold. Where we all help breaks loose on planet Earth at the time of tribulation. And the book of Revelation very clearly is predicting a great war in the future. The final act of provocation in Revelation asserts that the Antichrist will enter Jerusalem and declare himself God. This will mark the time for the final battle at a place called Armageddon. To many people, the word Armageddon has come to mean a final clash between good and evil. But it is in fact the name of an actual ancient battlefield in the Holy Land. The rapture adherents believe this final clash will also take place here. The Hebrew name is Har Megiddo. The name Armageddon only appears one time in the Bible. Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. The battle will literally take place there in Armageddon. They say Satan and his armies will meet God on this plain at the foot of Mount Megiddo. A fortress city at the crossroads of old trade routes leading to Jerusalem, Har Megiddo emerged around 3500 BC and witnessed many encounters that determined the future of the land. This is a fertile valley in which you could line up chariots in ancient times, tanks in modern times, uh, to have such a battle. It's the ideal place to fight a battle in any generation, especially in the end times. The book of Revelation culminates the Antichrist, uh, gathers his human armies. He's ruled the world. He's forced all people to worship him. Uh, he brings his armies to Megiddo, and they're preparing to do battle. The rapture sect thinks they will have arrived at that fateful moment, the one that will determine the fate of men's souls once and forever. With Satan's battle cry ringing in their ears, God readies his forces. Satan has always desired to worship the people. Well, the bottom line is that's really what I'm getting is all about. Finally comes down to an ultimate showdown where Satan says, okay, it's me or you. A final cataclysmic battle between the armies of God and the armies of Satan. The New Testament states that Christ predicted a time of tribulation plagued by disasters and cataclysms and ruled by a satanic leader, the Antichrist. The book of Revelation says that the suffering and chaos will eventually reach its peak. Satan is trying to oppress them. He knows his time is short. He knows he doesn't have much time to, to do it. So he intensifies his fight. 
the devil will have lured worshippers to his side, and together they will march as an army to defend his evil realm at the battlefield of Armageddon. The world is chaos, and it is as though God lets mankind push himself right to the edge of extinction and destruction before Christ returns to stop all of this and to intervene. And Jesus returns literally to rescue the world. For believers, it will be the ecstatic moment of a prophecy fulfilled. That is really the battle, the supernatural cosmic battle. It's easy to understand why it has gripped uh, the imagination of so many people so, so strongly. The book of Revelation says the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will return to purge the earth of Satan and his dark army by waging a cosmic battle to determine who will reign supreme. Jesus descends from heaven to earth, rides into battle on a charger, a war horse, wears a mantle stained with blood. He, he looks like a knight in shining armor going forth to battle in the most literal possible way. Satan and his army will be prepared for the battle. What the evil one doesn't know is that Jesus is now a warrior king, wielding a most powerful weapon, the word of God. Revelation describes Christ leading You see that? The word sword. of God. So everybody should believe in Jesus Christ. That's why I believe in him. He can't mess with the word of God. He says the word is over with. And some people say, so he isn't going to be violent. It's on his word. But he's killing them. They're going to be dead. He just speaks the word and it's over. The final triumphal vision is not Jesus, the kind and gentle figure of the gospel. He is a punishing, vengeful, bloodthirsty figure who takes lives by the countless thousands, such that blood runs in the street. When the dust settles, the word of God has slain Satan's army of men. The angels invite the vultures to come and, f and to the great feast of God. And what's served for dinner are the corpses of all the slain, the captains, the kings, the armies, and the horses, which are thousands dead on the battlefield. While the wicked armies of humankind have been destroyed, Satan and his emissaries remain. The trinity of evil has survived to face God's wrath. Christ and the saints destroy the beast and his human armies. The Bible says he takes the beast and the false prophet, casts them alive into the lake of fire. While the Antichrist and false prophet are cast into hell, God has a different plan for Satan. And after that, Christ comes and chains Satan for a thousand years. The beast is bound. Uh, he is held uh, for a thousand years while Christ establishes a, a kingdom of peace and righteousness and justice on earth. In Revelation, Satan is thrown into an abyss. His defeat heralds God's millennial Christian kingdom on earth, with Jerusalem as its capital. Those who chose the side of God will live in a utopian Christian kingdom. But the prophecy does not end there. Satan is defeated at Armageddon, but he's not finally out of the game until the end of the entire drama. Satan turns out to be a difficult enemy to defeat. <laughs>
Hi, ah, YouTube. YouTube. This video is now officially over. I see you guys at the flip on my next video and see you at the next episode of the boom boom boom. And I warned you guys about this Jesus Christ. Now you probably see reason why I am actually believing him than what I can possibly do to speak of. So peace out. See you next time at the boom boom room.